Andrew Yang book was quite good that I read. Um, oh, you read that, hey? Yeah, it's alarming, but I'm also very impressed with the amount of research that Yang does. Like, he's not your average, like, politician who's just full of platitudes and, and things. He just hammers down research and studies and stats in his books. That's um, good. A lot of it is about economic problems and what we could be facing due to automation, of course. Like, the vast majority of, of the book is about that. But he does offer solutions. Um, like uh, changing the tax system and other things like the value added tax wouldn't allow people to create tax havens. So it just, it just eliminates that whole concept is you basically just tax all purchases. And so, that, you know, I thought that made a bit more sense because the more you, the more shit you buy, the more taxes you're going to pay. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah so, that's, that's cool i for i started listening to uh his podcast on his youtube channel recently it, it seems like he's still he's still trying to get some sort of ubi implemented too yeah so i really loved his book i gave it five stars awesome. um i think if i had read that book before like everything happened i would have been a hardcore yang ganger oh cool Yes. Yeah. The, the book. I, hopefully, he he remains an active political voice. You know, in upcoming, you know, elections and things, because he provides a lot of research about how fucked up uh, the jobs are right now in the in the country. Right. Um, and how like the stock market doesn't prove shit about like the average American. Yeah, because the average the American aver isn't involved with it. Yeah, the average American has no stock. Yeah. So it just doesn't doesn't help the average American. Um, like GDP doesn't really represent the average American either. So it's, nice. it's a really good book. About how the, the stock market is still doing well in spite of all the coronavirus shit. It's because the uh, Fed is pumping money into it. Yeah, putting trillions of dollars into it. Yeah, it's just propping it up. This also reminds me too of um, I th I'm not sure if I told you like uh, relatively recently I finally read um, uh, Mark Blythe's book. I forget what it was oh, called. Oh, what was but, it? But he uh, made the one that I, the one that I heard about from through Mixed Mental Arts. Austerity, austerity. Yes, there you go. Yeah. And like this, re this reminds me of what he says in that book too. Like, yeah, it seems like, um, like I think he has pointed out too. Since the, especially since the U.S. market has such an influence on so much of the economy, I forget. I don't think I was hearing it this from him. I think I was hearing it from someone else. Like, apparently, eighty percent of the world's economy is on, uh, is based on U.S. dollars or something like that. So mm -hmm. it has so much more effect on the economy. So it's uh, well, that's one of the reasons that makes it easier for the Fed to pump trillions of dollars into the market without necessarily having as long, long term of effects as people would say. And he, he sort of makes Mark Blythe sort of makes that argument in that book about basically like triple trickle up economics instead of trickle down economics, because if you have more lower income people who have more money and more jobs and they can spend more money and put more money into the market. Yeah, that's basically Andrew Yang's argument, like give the little person money and they're going to spend it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, they're going to, in general, lead happier lives. Jobs are like one of his other arguments is um, health care for all, you know, that, that would have a big impact on small business owners because as a business, I think by law, you are required to provide health care benefits for anybody that works over like full time. Like that's right. by law. So if you relieve that burden from business owners, 
they would have the ability to hire more people because they don't have to pump in all this money for healthcare coverage. Because yes, um, people who have healthcare through their employer, they are paying into it, but also the businesses as well. So when you pay healthcare insurance, you're, you're not really paying the full cost. Your employer is also paying some of that cost as well. Right. And then obviously with, with coronavirus, one of the, um, one of the problems with your employer providing your health care is that if you don't, if with so many people not having jobs, that means that they don't have health care at times when they really fucking need it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, it, it, dem- it depends on how angry people get. And, you know, I think... I think the rise in populism is definitely because of these particular types of issues. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that people that's... have to work. It's people have to work more for less. Yeah. And what I mean is that, um, like the gig economy, you have no health care there. Um, people's wages aren't really rising to the occasion as far as like the growth of wages is just not there. Yeah. Um, people, are, people are getting frustrated. Yeah. This is one theme that, uh, that crystal ball and Sager and Jetty talk about on the Hill. That's a, there's a reminder of that because obviously you watched that, um, that Joe Rogan podcast with them the other day, right? Yeah. Yeah. I watched it. It was quite good. Um, I just like their honesty, and it's cool that they have two people on the show. Yeah, they're both populists, but they're also kind of from different sides. Like Sagar's more conservative, uh, Crystal Ball's more liberal, and we can, we always get like some pretty good dialogues between them about yeah. these things. It's it's cool that they that they agree on so much. My favorite parts are actually when they do disagree because it happens so seldomly and because they don't like scream at each other. They actually have reasonable debates about those issues. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But um, what else did I read? Uh, well, I didn't finish this book called Anathem. It's a science fiction book. It's, it was like almost 30 hours. But the um, the library took it for me before I could finish it. I would say, because I know Daniel Green um, has a lot of problems with modern science fiction, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this book is a modern science fiction book that's written more like a classic where it's more about the science fiction elements than like the human drama and all that. Oh, cool. I love so classic I, science fiction like Isaac Asimov and uh, and Ray Bradbury and Robert Heinlein. Yeah, I think you'd like it. Um, it's like, what if a society was invaded by aliens that wasn't an Earth society? So we get the main character, like the society has like a caste system um, all of the intellectuals are basically monks. So they live like monks, very Spartan lifestyles, and all they do is study, and, and they're, like, super intelligent. And then you have, like, what they call the secular world, which is everybody else. So the monks are totally, like, cloistered away. Some monks um, come out every 10 years to show their discoveries to the world. Some come out every 100 and then there's some that come out every thousand. It's actually unclear how long these people live for. That's what I, I couldn't figure out. Um, but it was really interesting to see, like, what would a society to do upon threat of alien invasion? But it's a really cool book. It's called Anathem. Um, and I think it's gotten some science fiction awards. But I would recommend it if you're looking for science fiction that's very much based in the vein of classic science fiction. There's a whole lot of heavy. There's a lot of heavy science in it. Um, 
I will add it to my list of books that I want to read. How do you spell yeah. that? Anathem. So it's A N A T H E M. Okay. Um, I didn't finish it, and it gets like super good. Like it starts to become really actiony at the end. Not super actiony, but there's always a level of like interesting science that's going on in the book and there's a lot of talk about you know like if you if you've read an asimov book there's always like a lot of explanations of science in his book uh, they do a lot in, as well in this book so I, I thought it was really fascinating cool um and it's long i think it's probably if you were to read it i, I believe it's like 900 something pages oh okay um really good um Another book I started uh, recently, I'm halfway through, is the first book in the Night Angel trilogy um, by Brent Weeks. He's also the guy that wrote the um, Lightbringer series, which oh, I talked to you about. Oh, that's why I recognize his name. Yeah, yeah, it's his. He wrote this first, so um i actually really like it because it's this i love assassin fantasy and that's what it is um and all of the moral questions that come with you know a, someone having to kill people for, for a job and how do they disassociate themselves from their job and what they do and then it, it's pretty good so far um i would recommend it i think he has a really easy um, writing style to get into is that it's the uh, Night Angel trilogy? Yeah, by Brent Weeks. Okay. Yeah, um, um, the Conan the Conan stories are basically assassin fantasy too, but they're also pulp fantasy. So there's no, there aren't really any moral philosophical questions. It's just I love them for what they are, and they're really well written too. The writing of Robert E. Howard is great, but it's just like it's mostly just like Conan going around and being a being a jacked okay. badass, and killing a bunch of monsters, and stealing stealing jewels, and and uh, you know that kind, of, and getting into battles, and yeah, being like uh, just uh, rescuing women, and then just being like <laughs> you're hot, and then just starting kissing them, and then they eventually give in. You know, classic. The lamentation. Do you get to hear the lamentations of the women? Uh, only a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you hear buzzing? No. Okay, great. Um, hey, what else did I read? Uh, I've been getting to the Malazan book, which is, I like it. It's one of those books that has like a lot of characters in it thrust at you in the beginning. So it, it takes getting used to figuring out who's who. Um, and it's it's like political slash military based like conflicts. Right, right. I remember hearing it, that. Yeah. Yeah. So like like right in the beginning of the book, there's like this huge battle, and a lot of people get, are killed and maimed. And the main one of the main characters is just like this chubby lady. Like they tell you that oh she's kind of fat. <laughs> <laughs> Which I like when I like when the heroes are like non-standard, you know, Hollywood types. You know, I always yeah, find that cool. pretty interesting. Like that's what, yeah, that's what they do in Lightbringer. Like one of the main protagonists is like this chubby. I guess he was kind of a loser growing up. Uh, he has a hard time with girls because he's very self. Um, what do you call it? People who are has low, not low self-esteem, but what do you call that one? People have Self, a low... Self-deprecating? Well, I guess he has low self-esteem. Mainly, okay. this. yeah, he does have self-esteem issues, for sure. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, um, that's a pretty good one. I would recommend it. I'm um, also finished... A Farseer number two, which is Assassin's... Uh, something assassins. It's weird because this Farseer book, like 
they all the titles are like Assassin's Apprentice and Assassin this and Assassin that. But it's not really an assassin fantasy. It's weird. It's more a political maneuvering fantasy. Because the assassin stuff is like not really highlighted much. And some of the missions he goes on, you just hear summaries of them. You don't actually get to see him do the missions. And the very, very few missions that he does go on... Um, don't turn out the way you think they would. Like he ends up like befriending the person instead of killing him and, and stuff like that. So um, it's by Robin Hobb and it's um, oddly enough, it's also first person. So um, it took me a while to get into that, but it's fine now. It was a little bit of a jolt when I first started reading it because I'm not really used to reading that many first person books. Okay. But um, I got I got into it. I think the second book is definitely better than the first. But um, I don't even know what it's called. It's I just call it Farseer Two. But it's it's called Assassin's Quest, maybe or okay. I don't know something yeah. with a something with assassin in it. <laughs> I'm doing injustice to it, but oh well. <laughs> 